sent me in here with a spiritual sword to cut to the right and the left and to declare that day is over. The devil is a liar. You've been held back by your own misunderstanding of God. You have misjudged God. God did not bring you this far to leave you now. God has had his hand in everything that has happened in your life. No good thing will he withhold from you. He is purposely planning your tomorrow. He is putting you in the position where you can start expecting what is going to happen in your life. You can move out of your hesitancy and be who he has called you to be, a light to the nations, a voice to others, a witness to the world. Touch somebody and tell them, start witnessing through what you're going through. Welcome again, my brothers and sisters, to Lessons from the Cutting Room Floor, our weekly Bible time together, our study time together. When we come together to share the truth of what the Word says and look at it in context of the sermon that was preached on Sunday. In fact, I'm inviting all of you to go back and listen to the sermon preached on Pentecost Sunday and to add this to your library about that sermon. In fact, throughout the week, if you would go back to the Bible study, go back to the sermon so that you can really get the understanding of what Pentecost was all about. I teach the lessons after the sermon so that you can get a wider lens through which to see the text and to get a better understanding of the will of God for your life and the circumstances and situations in which you find yourself. The word is given to be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. It's given to be a guide for us in all matters of faith and life. And so I hope that you'll use these messages in such a way as to embolden your faith and to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Listen, there's a lot going on at New Psalmist. This is the weekend that we're celebrating with our youth. Our youth are having their first kickoff event. And we invite youth from everywhere to meet us up here Saturday, or rather Friday night. They're having a great kickoff experience right over in our new Connection Center. Thomas Plummer Connection Center is open for business now, for activity. And they'll be meeting there. They've got a lot of activities they're going to be doing. So all of our high school or junior high school age youth, starting at age 11 or 12, you're welcome. And coming on up to high school, you're welcome to be up here with us. we got a lot of, a lot of territory up here. We want you to come and have a ball. Then Sunday... We're gathering with all of our youth and all of their parents and guardians, grandparents, right in our Connection Center. The youth will be in the lounge area. The parents will be in the discussion area because we want you to know what kind of program we're putting forth before your young people, and we want your involvement. So that's, Saturday, that's Sunday right after service. They'll be right in the Connection Center, and I hope you'll be up here to come and be a part of that. Parents, grandparents, we want all of you to come over and share and learn and get experience. And our children will be on the other side, our youth rather will be on the other side in the lounge portion of our Connection Center. Then next Friday, the next weekend, our young adult women are having an event here. And they're inviting all the church girls to come out and be a part of their event next, fr next weekend, next Friday the 10th. They're looking for all of you to come and be a part of their experience. It's going to be off the chain. We got a lot going on in June. We're celebrating all of our graduates this Sunday. Everybody's graduating. We're celebrating them. We need, for those of you who are members of New Psalmist, send in your photo, the school you're graduating from. Let us have all the information so that we can post the pictures. But we're celebrating our graduates this Sunday. We're celebrating our children on the second Sunday celebrating its Children's Day here on the second Sunday. We'll be celebrating all of our children. The girls to women are having their, the young girls to women who start at age 11, they're having their event this weekend. Saturday, I think, is their time. You're going to, I mean, there's so much happening. They are, no, they are, yeah, they're this weekend, our girls to women. If your child is in, started at age 11 and goes up, be sure to call the church and be a part of that experience. Register for that for this week. Young adult women, register for next week. It's going to be off the chain. Well, now it's almost time to jump into the Word. 
almost time to jump into the word. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for who you are and what you do in our lives. Thank you for the blessing you give us. Now bless this lesson and may it be inspiring for those who share with us. Thank you for the power and the person and the presence of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. My brothers and my sisters, open your Bibles to the first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. Now remember, the Acts of the Apostles are the sequel to the Gospel of Luke, both of them written by Luke the physician. Um, and they are written almost as a two-part compendium so that in the first part, he tells us about what Jesus began to do and to teach. And in the second part, the Acts of the Apostles, we learn how the early church spreads from Jerusalem to Rome under the aegis, the auspices of the power of the Holy Spirit. First book is about the gospel, the good news that Jesus, of Jesus Christ and his impact upon the world, especially upon 12 men called disciples. And then how the organization, institution, the community that he founded around his life and death and resurrection, the church, spread from Jerusalem all the way to the capital city of Rome. Those are, that's the twin books of Luke Acts. <clears throat> we call it the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then Acts, because we're relating it to the four, to the five books of the Pentateuch that open up the Old Testament, the books of history, uh, Moses, or rather the books of the Torah that Moses would give, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books. And then we get the history books, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and on into the Kings and Samuel, or rather into Samuel, and then the Kings, and then Chronicles. Well, the New Testament is the four Gospels that match the five, first five books of the Bible. And then the book of Acts, which represents the history to mark the books of Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles of the Old Testament, the history of Israel. And then we have the letters that mark the letters of prophecy. And it ends with the apocalypse, an eschatology, the book of the Revelation that talks about some of the, or gives us the same imagery of what we find in Ezekiel and Daniel, the eschaton in the Old Testament. Just a little, little quick synopsis of the organization of the New Testament and how it mirrors in many ways the organization of the Old Testament. So we start now into the history. What happened after Jesus died? What would become of this new movement? Would it die on the vine? Would it just pass away? Would it, would it end? Was it of such a nature that the death on the cross would be its demise? And would the resurrection just be an addendum to a historical event? But whatever the event was, it was not a catalyst for something else. Whatever and whoever Jesus was, he was a moment. He was not a catalyst for the changing of history. The world would have wanted him to be just a moment. But God's plan was that Jesus would be a catalyst for the changing of history. And how would that take place? Because his time with the 12, not everyone else, not the great nation, not all of the cities, but his time with the 12 was so intensive that it could not end with his death and could not end with his ascension. Something in them cried out for more. Something in them cried out for more. And so we come to this first chapter and into this second chapter because Pentecost does happen. The first chapter is the announcement that this is not over. That the disciples, let me go back. 
Let's hit chapter one. In my former book, Theophilus, that I have written about all Jesus began to do and to teach, that is the gospel of Luke. And he's sharing those things. And after his suffering, verse 3, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Now remember, this has been a life-altering experience for them cognitively. And it has made them want to stay a part of it anymore. They will, they're clinging to a thread for every crumb they can get of the continuation of the effort. But they need God to keep feeding them. They need God to keep giving them something because to be very, be very honest, they do not have yet what they will need to go forward. They do not have yet the final gift of Christ. Oh, I like saying it that way. They do not have his final gift to them his final empowerment of them. They've loved him. The, ma the, the world is hoping that Jesus was an event. And even though some are saying he's alive, this will be over. This will be over. But in the plan of God, this will not end. It cannot end because of the investment put in the disciples. But the investment is not finished. There is something the resurrected Christ has to do for them that only the resurrected Christ could do. They thought they had seen it all when they saw the living Jesus walking and talking, the one born of Mary. They thought he was the living last word, raising the dead, opening the eyes of the blind, showing them the possibility of superhuman, showing them the possibility of supernatural that they could be a natural person in all of this. In fact, Jesus said, greater things than these shall I do. But that wasn't going to be sufficient. They needed to see the resurrected Christ and receive the power of the resurrected Christ, I get what I'm going to say, so that their resurrection could begin now. Remember, Jesus said to Mary and Martha, I am the resurrection and the life so that they would not just be a participant or partic participate in the life Jesus was living, they would be participating in the life of the eternal Christ, the Christ who was, is, and is forevermore. They would be a part of the eternality of Christ. They would no longer have to look for the end because they were living in the new beginning. Somebody write that down. What Christ offers us as the resurrected Christ is to live in the power that causes us to not have to look for the end, but to live in the new beginning. The end, the flesh and blood death will come, but I am already living in the new beginning. Jesus is showing up, showing them the resurrected Christ, showing them the new beginning. But they cannot participate in it yet until they receive his power, till they receive the power that is at work in him so it can at work, it be at work in them. That same power. They saw it, but they saw it to a human limitation. Now they see him almost as Peter, James, and John did on the mountain transfiguration for who he totally is. I was going to say for who he really is. No, for who he totally is. He is fully man, but he is also fully God. And he offers us the opportunity to be a part of and to live like and to be dwelt with the power of of the resurrected Christ. Somebody write that down. Somebody write that down. Living with the power of the resurrected Christ so that I no longer have to look for the end. When is the end coming? Remember, they said, when are you going to establish the end? Jesus said, that time is not to know, but you shall be filled with power. 
you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. It's not for yours to know when, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You won't have to worry about when it's going to end because you'll start living in the new beginning. You'll start living in a whole new reality now. What you're looking for, somebody write this down. What you're looking for, you're already beginning to live in. You're already beginning to live in the joy of the Lord. You're already beginning to live in the power of his might. You're already beginning to live in the glory of the kingdom. You're already beginning to live in the place where power resides and presence of God fills the space. You're already beginning to live. The three-year journey, the disciples' journey couldn't end. It couldn't end because what they were impacted by was so powerful. They had to want to and had to live for seeing the next level. They wanted to see it. They wanted to anticipate it. They wanted to be in it. But they, they knew they couldn't enter it. And if Jesus left, they would just be men who experienced being blessed but could not, but did not have the fire to make that moment keep living. Why? Because the power of the resurrected Christ is needed to do that. You can know all the church in the world. You can know all the scriptures in the world. But without the power of Christ at work in your life, without the power of Christ moving those things into their proper place and anointing them with the power of heaven, your sounding brass and a tingling cymbal, unable and incompetent in the situations in which you find yourself. You are not able to do fully, brilliantly, or completely what God wants done because the power of the resurrected Christ is what is required to use kingdom power. Somebody will say, well, how do I get that? How, how, how does that happen? Well, what, what needs to happen in my life? Well, the first thing is you have to realize like these disciples, let's go back to it. On one occasion, he says to them, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. One of the first things you have to do in this season, when you recognize God's been blessing your life and your cup is running over. But when it comes to transformation of who you are into who he knows you can be and who you glimpse you want to be, you want to walk in the spirit and flow in the spirit and live in the spirit, but you know you aren't. Then the first thing you have to do is admit, acknowledge, confess that you really know that Jesus is leading you to something more. He's leading you to something more. His plan is evolving you, trying to take us from one level to another. That's been a constant theme you've been hearing me preach and teach over this last year, especially as we've come out of COVID, that the Lord is trying to get us to evolve to evolve, to, but in order to evolve, you have to recognize where you are. Recognize what are the deficiencies, what are the shortcomings? What is it that you are lacking? The disciples are hiding in this upper room. They're living in this upper room. They're afraid, they're worried, but Jesus keeps popping up and told them, don't leave Jerusalem. Don't come and go. Don't keep skipping out, trying to find something more. Wait for me to put it in your life. You know, it's amazing that after COVID, folk have come out of their caves, come off the ark, and they're looking for so much more life. They're getting dolled up to go out every weekend. They're finding places to go. Everybody got to hang out with their homies and their girlfriends. Now, I don't see as many couple pictures on Instagram anymore as I used to because everybody's got to hang out with the crowd that's affirming them, 
affirming their disappointments, affirming their efforts, and making them feel good about who they are, and making them believe that they are more. But the reality of it is we're doing all of that because we don't feel like we are more. We don't feel like we're in touch with more. When I was much younger, I remember, because Hampton University Ministers Conference meets next week, all of us would get together and we'd ride down to Hampton. Oh my God, Reverend Booth, uh, from, who was at the time at St. Paul in Westchester, Pennsylvania, uh, Reverend Jesse, Dr. Jesse Mapson, uh, Jay Wendell Mapson, who was at Elizabeth, in Elizabeth, uh, New Jersey, um, uh, Levi Benjamin Baldwin, who was at Mount Pleasant outside of uh, Chester and uh, in, in the, the rural area of, or the suburban areas there. Uh, all of us would be riding down, hanging out, Jacob Chapman, so many others, Michael Harris down in Atlanta, now, we, who was at Wheat Street Baptist. And we'd be hanging out, uh, Russell Orchard in Louisville, Kentucky, who at the time was at First Baptist Church in um, uh, Fredericksburg, Maryland, Fredericksburg, Virginia, all of us in different locations. We'd get to Hampton and we'd be up every night, all night long. I mean, we would go to the sessions. In those days, we'd go to an all night market after service and we buy our food and they cook it on the grill and we'd sit there. Then we'd go over somebody's room. Russell normally stayed in the high rent district. So we would go over to Russell's room and we'd be up till three and four and five o'clock in the morning. Nobody wanted to go home because nobody wanted to miss anything. We didn't want to miss out on anything. By Thursday, and all of us had to preach on Sunday. By Thursday, we could barely talk. Voices are gone. We so tired, we can barely make it, but we weren't gonna miss nothing. We had in those days what they didn't have now, FOMO, fear of missing out. We had a fear of missing out. Everybody talks about it now, FOMO, F-O-M-O, fear of missing out. But that's why we did it. We were into that long before they had their acrostic for it. Now, each of us will be there. The service will be over and here's our line, see you tomorrow because we don't have to do that anymore. We've realized no matter how late you stay up, no matter who you hang out with, that ain't it. What you're afraid of missing out on, you find out was nothing. And you begin to start centering your life around something else. I get tickled at third Poco in there uh, 40s and 50s, still trying to act like they're teenagers because they, they're trying to act as if I can fill my life. I can fill my life with the power to have life. The disciples are watching Jesus pop up in their space and they are excited, but they know when he's gone, we can't replicate this. We can come up with some facsimiles we, you know, and, and I remember uh, when Joshua was little, he was into basketball shirts. And there were authentics, there was one other category, and there were replicas. You can come up with a replica life, but it's not an authentic. It's not an authentic. These disciples have been touched by Jesus. He's showing up with them. They want to know, are you going to establish the kingdom? Right now, is this, is the end coming? Is it all going to start now? Jesus says, you don't have to worry about the end. You don't have to keep wondering about when it's going to end. I'm going to give you power to live in the new beginning. And if you're wondering what the new beginning looks like, it looks like me. When I was among you and working, you saw humanity and you saw and thought, when is all of this going to end? But I'm showing you, you can start living in the new beginning because I am with you and this is what it looks like. And I'm going to give you the power to do it. But it's not going to be worldly power. It is not going to be human power. It's not going to be your intellect or your sophistication. It's not going to be, brothers, how cool you are. How, 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 much, how macho you can look in a photograph. 
Ladies, it's not going to be how stylish you are. It's going to be the power of God exploding inside of you, bringing forth light all around you that causes folk to be drawn to you, to drawn to the light. And unlike the light that kills the moth or the sun that killed Icarus, the light that is in you will banish the darkness in them. The light that is in you will banish the darkness in them. Then you will be able to have all you have. But all it will do is add to who God is in you. Notice I didn't say add to who you are. No, it will only add to who God is in you. It'll dress it up. It'll put something on it. But the realness will be who God is in you. They will see the power of God at work in your life. This was all novel for these men because they had never had something like this happen in their space. They had seen Jesus put the power that was his in the lives of those he did miracles for. But they had only tangentially touched it. They had, they had lived vicariously through the miracles of others. But now the Lord is saying to them, I am going to put this transformative power in you, in you. And when it happens, you will be transformed. You will not be who you were. Your whole way of thinking will change. The reason we have the Acts, the book of the Acts of the Apostles, is because the Holy Spirit changed the way they thought, the way they interpreted life, the way they saw God, and the way they saw their mission in life. The Holy Spirit doesn't make you shout, doesn't make you run around. He makes you see the meaning, purpose, and power of Jesus Christ and understand it and then empowers you, empowers me to live it. You know, most of us would put a check mark beside Jesus on, he is the best of everything. He is the sunum bonum gift that God has given to us. There's nothing higher than him. But we do not consider that he wants us to rise up to his measurement status. Knowing that there will always be a humanity that's clinging to us, but that there is his divinity in us, stretching us to try to be like him with the awareness that when we close our eyes on this side, we journey to the place where the souls of just men are made perfect and God will finish the work so that the human encumbrance is gone and all we are, all we see is Christ, and he is all in all. We will be drawn back just as we were sent forth. My God, Jesus is saying, I mean, this, he's saying to his disciples, in a few days, you're going to claim a new level. But the only reason you'll claim that new level is because of the Holy Spirit. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You know, I hear people talking about, I got, so-and-so got the Spirit or they got the Holy Spirit. No, 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 no. I need you to think of the experience of baptism. Baptism is not Brill Cream, a little dab or do you. Baptism, baptizo in the New Testament is the immersion. You are going fully under. In other words, now get what I'm saying, write this down. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just the Holy Spirit coming in you. But in other words, you are, the you that is you is going into the reality of the Holy Spirit. 
You heard me teach and preach for these last weeks that we live in the reality of God. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You will be immersed in the Holy Spirit. I've told you before, some years ago, I went scuba diving. And, you know, I swim in a cement pond. Uh, I learned how to swim in the pool. I, the, our, the Red Cross had me as one of their students from beginner straight on up. And I enjoyed learning how to swim and taking all of the different lessons to be a good swimmer, to be a proficient swimmer, to, be how to, to know how to rescue others. I can swim underwater and I like swimming underwater, looking at the side of the pool and keep on going because I'm a great cement pool, to quote uh, Granny from Beverly Hillbillies. I'm a great cement pool, cement pond swimmer. But when you're in the ocean, it's altogether different. When you go down below the water's edge in the ocean and get down, oh, just about five or 10 feet, and you look up and you see the water. But then you look out and you see water. You look out and you realize you are not on top of the, the pond or on top of the pool looking at the water as part of the landscape. You are underwater. And the water is the landscape. And you are in the landscape. You're not on it. You're in it. Jesus says, that's what you are going to be dipped into the reality of the Spirit. You're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's going to flow all over you. You are going to be, it is going to be every. it is going to be all over you. You're not going to be like Achilles, held by the heel and dipped in the water and found invincible in your body except in your heel. No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit is going to wash over you and in doing so, give you the reality of God. You constantly hear me talk about being in the reality of God. How will I know it? Because I will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. God will put me in it. Coming to church is not baptism in the Holy Spirit. Waving your hands is not baptism in the Holy Spirit. No, 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 no. It is the moment you start recognizing God. I do want this more. I want to live in this. And I'm willing to move from all of my hesitation all of my hesitancy, knowing what I'm not, knowing where I am in the Jerusalem, my questions about you to a sense of expectation of living in the reality that is yours. The reality that is mine that I cling to and hold to. I need to release to the reality that is yours that you keep allowing to expand all around me to show me what I haven't seen before and who I haven't been before. And I want to say to somebody who's, who's sharing this class tonight, who wants what Christ has pledged and promised to do, but you're hesitant. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I want to be, I don't want to be running around the church. I don't know if I want to be falling out. I, I don't know if, if I want that. Let me share this with you. Your vision of you and your vision of God's work and explosion in your life is not big enough. It's not commanding enough. It doesn't grip you enough. You can say no to it. And so that's why it has not made itself known to you. What God is trying to show you, you can't say no to. If you will listen to him and stay in Jerusalem and quit running back to the world to get your answers, running back and forth to fake friends and friends who got no answers, all they got is trouble. And thinking, I remember, I mean, the beauty of being old is you can say I have been young. You can hang out all night and you still don't know no more tomorrow. Still won't know a bit more tomorrow. You gotta stay in Jerusalem. You gotta stay around the God who keeps on giving you questions that he won't answer and giving you situations that make you mad. You got to stay there. You got to hang in there. You got to wait. 
You got to wait until you get to the point where you say, I got to trade this stress for strength. God has been too faithful in my life for me to keep saying, what's he doing? You got to stay there with that stress until you can say, I can trust. He didn't bring me this far to leave me now. Because God can't put you, can't baptize you with his spirit if you are still not committed to who he is in your life. If God has to, if God is not God in your life, then he cannot baptize you in his spirit because you will not appreciate it, appropriate it, nor will you share it with the rest of the world. Your vision's too small. Your God, is, as Sister Lauren Tullerback said to me, Catholic sister said to me, your God just too small. See, your Christ is not transformative. He's just reformative. He fixes stuff. He doesn't tear stuff up and give you new stuff. You are limiting your vision, and therefore it runs aground with every obstacle. And when, and, but, but when can, in the words of scriptures, when can Christ press upon your heart and mind that he is able to do all things exceeding and abundant more than you ask or think? When do you actually start saying in your heart and mind, Christ can do everything for me. I just need to let him be Christ. When you can start moving from hesitancy to a sense of expectation, what's coming next? Not, not what's coming in your life. What's God about to do next in my life? Jesus has been showing up for these disciples. How's he been showing up for you? Does he show up on Sunday morning in the sermon? Does he show up while you're driving the car? Does he show up in music that you listen to? Does he show up while you're standing by the sink trying to figure out a problem, trying to deal with a concern? Does he show up when you find yourself in tickly and ticklish situations that you know you shouldn't have put yourself in. When does Jesus show up? For 40 days, he showed up to the disciples, trying to get them to realize your vision is too small. What you're expecting of me is too small. Are you going to restore the kingdom? You expect me to just do something to get all of this settled and away from. I need you to start thinking bigger. I'm about to give you power to, to live, operate, walk, and be like me. And let me restate that because power is neutral. I'm about to fill your life with the person presence of the Holy Spirit in such a way that you're going to want to and you're going to be able to live and walk and do just like me. I'm going to fill you with the one that filled me. I'm going to. You have met the second person of the Trinity. You have met the son of God who is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, who operates in the Father's will. But now I'm going to introduce you to the one who brought all of that into my humanity because I emptied myself of my divinity to come and walk among you. But I'm going to introduce you to the one that God gives to all of us, to all of us in our humanity, that we might be like our Heavenly Father so that you can want, but you're going to have to want to be like me. Many of us want God's power, but we just don't want to be like him. Sunday, I used this example. If I had two mountains, one here and one here, and I stood you on one side with me, and you looked across, there was no bridge to walk over to the other mountain. You couldn't see what was there. And I said to you, there's a $20 bill right at the top of that mountain. It's yours if you go get it. Most of you would look at me and say, thanks, but no thanks. And mountains high, I don't feel like climbing. This is what I'm going to say. I don't feel like climbing all the way up there for $20. I don't feel like climbing up there for $20. But if I were to say to you, you go to the top of that mountain, everything you see, for as far as you can see, it belongs to you. That land is filled with oil and or precious stones and minerals, and oil, and fuels, all of that will be yours. Whatever you lay your eyes on, it's yours. All those fertile fields, there are ponds that, that are there. There are 
all kinds of animals there. It is a great place to build and to, to, to have. Everything you can see for as far as you can see is yours. Most of you would start hustling down that mountain and trying to get up that next mountain as fast as you could. Why? Because as soon as your feet touch it, it's yours. Because it offers you something big enough. That's what Jesus means when he says you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He's offering you something big enough. Something bigger than you can imagine. He's offering you the, the power and the presence and the isness of the resurrected Christ living in you. Which means everything he was when he was a man. And everything he is, now that he has risen and sitting at the right hand of the Father, he is bringing into your, your life. So much so that the Father says, and Paul quotes him, you are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus. You are an heir and joint heir with Jesus. Everything that the Father has is yours. When you walk in the will of the Son, when you walk in the Spirit of Christ, then all that the Father has is given to us. And the Father looks for us not to do it now and then, for it to be just what we do on Sunday, but he looks for us to live like we know we are baptized in this Spirit. We did Baptism Sunday. Baptism, you saw us immerse persons. The old folk used to say they went down a wet devil and came up, a, they went down a dry devil and came up a wet devil. But the real purpose of baptism is it's an outside show to the world, an outward show to the world of an inward change in your heart, that God has washed away all of that. He has washed it away and made you clean and whole. We have been dipped in the reality of God, in the rivers of heaven, and they have changed us, altered us, and made us who we now are, sons and daughters of Christ. John put it this way, and he came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, this is John chapter 1, to them gave he power to be the sons and daughters of God. Somebody missed that. To them gave he power to be the sons and daughters of God. So this baptism, this baptism that's coming to them, and they, they're beginning to get anxious. What does, it, what does this mean? What does it look like? They've never seen it, you know. They have no idea about Pentecost. We study it every year. This was the first one, first one they'd heard of that was going to be different from the Jewish festival of ingathering. They're getting their, their first, all of their harvest in. Pentecost was a harvest festival. And now all of a sudden it is becoming a spiritual festival. It is the outpouring at the ingathering. It is the outpouring at the ingathering. God is pouring out his spirit. And so what happens? Ten days later, Acts chapter 2 and 1, ten days later, they're in one place and they're what? On one accord. They've gotten their spiritual acts together. They are no longer hesitant. They're expecting. They're no longer stressed. They're strengthening. And God says, now... It's time, now that I've got you here, it's time for me to disrupt your order. It's time for me to disrupt and get your attention. It's time for me to make you cognizant that I'm in your midst, that I'm moving right among you. And how did he do it? And suddenly, there was a sound. And suddenly, there was a sound, like as unto a rushing mighty wind, a blowing of a violent wind. It was a sound like that. It didn't say it was a wind. It was a sound like a wind. And it came from heaven. It came from up. And it filled the whole house 
No matter where you went, no matter how you turned, you heard it. No matter what room you were in, you heard this sound. Everywhere where they were sitting, they heard this. And then they saw something. See, what I've learned is when God's about to do a great work in our lives and move us to the second level, another level, he makes us uncomfortable with our reality. Because in order to be baptized by the Spirit, we've got to be uncomfortable with the reality in which we're living. We have to have something greater replace something lesser. We have to become uncomfortable. And he did that for them. It has Jesus popping up on them. They're uncomfortable with who they are. Who they are. He has to get our attention. Has to grab our attention so that we begin to see something major is about to happen. He is about to do something that is going to change the course of events. He grabs our attention before he acts in our lives. He gets us and then he acts because he doesn't want us to miss it. So he jars us. They hear a sound that jars them. They don't know what it is, but it jars them. It grabs a hold of them. Paul saw a light on the Damascus road and it knocked him to his feet. Moses saw a bush burning that was not consumed. God does stuff to get our attention. Amos saw a basket of summer fruit. God moving. Isaiah was in the temple and saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filling the temple. God getting the attention. You and I have a conversation. We see something and it gets our attention. We come to church and hear a sermon and it grabs our attention. We're in a conversation with somebody and it gets our attention. He gets our attention. Somebody calls us with the very thing we're thinking about and musing over. He gets our attention. He gets our attention in our house. He gets our attention in the car. He even gets our attention in church. You'll feel something. You'll, 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 you'll feel like you're bearing something. You'll hear something said that causes you to sit up and start listening. In fact, that's what happens to, self, to people when Jesus died. They saw something. They heard something. They felt something. And it caused them to sit up. It caused them to notice God moving. It's what they saw that day that made them listen and then cry out, surely this man was the son of God. They heard something and it disrupted their order, how they had tried to order their lives in that moment to, to handle all they were facing. Their order in the upper room, they were on one accord. They had gotten past all their nervousness. My salvation came because I heard something that made me listen to what followed it. I heard something, I heard the choir singing. I, I, I heard the saints saying amen. And I heard the preacher preaching. And I heard what came after, after it. Who wants to give their life to Christ? Who wants to be baptized? And I got up and I walked down the aisle. You see, when you're dealing with God, he will get your attention. And when he does, you have to move from passive to active listening. Listening that calls forth an action and a behavior. Their world was being disrupted by a mighty sound. What's the mighty sound in your world that's disrupting it right now? Ooh, God, I just hit a nerve. What's the mighty sound that's disrupting your life right now? Remember, they would be baptized by the Spirit. The text says the entire room was filled where they were seated. And everywhere they turned, they heard it. Everywhere they moved, they heard it. They were inside the move of God. And God was pouring it on. This is the beginning. They are inside the move of God. They can't get away from it. Every place they are, they're inside of it. They're inside of this move of God. Then the text says they 
saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. They saw big fireballs that split up and rested over each one. Then remember, fire in the Bible is purification and perseverance. Purification and perseverance. This was purification, cleansing, the cleansing fire. Cleansing fire. The seraphims brought the fire to cleanse Isaiah. It's the fire that takes out the impurities. It's the refiner's fire. But it's also perseverance. It's the fire that says we keep going. It's the fire that transforms us. It's the fire that transforms us, burns away the chaff, and transforms us into what we shall be. Recreates us in his image. And it's not to be feared, it's to be embraced because God is changing us. Fire represents the transforming of agent of God. But here's the other piece about it. Now write this down. On the one hand, he says, you'll be baptized. You'll be put into the baptism, the baptismal. You will be submerged in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit you're seeing in witnesses is fire the fire that will burn off all the impurities in your life. Some of them we want to keep, but believe me, they're going to get burned off. We want to keep them because we have no sense of the other thing that God does. See, the fire is not just purification, purging, and perseverance. The fire is also, represents also the trans transforming agent of God. And what is the transforming agent of God? His glory. His glory. When we talk about baptized in power, in this case, it's his glory. See, the purging takes something out of me and it leaves space in me. Space for what? The fire that is descending. The fire that is the glory of God now resting in me. The fire purged, but the fire filled. This fire that purged and burned out also filled up. Notice the text does not imply the fire went out. The fire purged and then filled. <clears throat> the fire represents the glory. Remember in Exodus, the Lord leads them out of Egypt, pillar by day, a cloud by day, and a pillar of fire by night. Fire represented his glory. It was the, it was the invisible, the, the fire represented the invisible God. It was a representation of the invisible God, of his guiding presence. And what they saw that day let them know that the God of all gods was in their midst. When they saw that fire and saw it descend upon them as the coal descended on Isaiah, they realized this fire purged, but it also filled. And it filled them with the glory. It rested on them. God expressed himself to each one of them. Now, I'm getting ready near the end. Each of you have got to understand, this transformative power was not just for some. It's not just for me to preach about. It's for you. It's for all of us. It rested on each of them. The text doesn't say that the tongues divided and sat on Peter, James, and John, and then sat over here on Mary and Matthias. No, it said on, rested on all of them. What God is doing in this season, he wants to do on all of his believers. You just have to make sure you're one of them. And you want God to do it in your life. You want God to fill your cup and make it overflow. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the agency, the vehicle by which the resurrected power of Jesus Christ is made manifest in us. He comes to enlighten us to who Jesus is, to unify us with the Father and the Son, and also to make manifest in us the resurrected power of Jesus Christ. 
the power that you see at work in him at work in you. The power that is neutral in its sense, but positively purposeful in his hand is now in you. And you live and have your being in him, which means you move like him. So not only whatever you ask of the father, whatever the father asks of you, you let God's power flow through you to and for his people's sake the way he wants it to flow. Why? Because you are walking in the spirit of Christ. You are baptized in his spirit. It flows over you, in you, around you, and through you. He teaches and he delivers. The Holy Spirit comes into our lives and he brings the power of the resurrected Christ. The Holy Spirit is the third portion of the Trinity third person. He is the unifying person. The Father is the creator. The Son is the redeemer. And the Holy Spirit is the unifier. He unites us with the Father and the Son. He comes not to bear witness to himself. One of our earlier Bible classes, we taught on the Holy Spirit. He comes not to bear witness of himself, but that we might know the Christ who we watched among us. Because what we're doing when we bear witness of Jesus, we are helping, he's helping us understand how this power that was at work in Christ, that is now at work in us, should be made manifest in the world according to the will and purpose of the Father. He's doing all of that in us while at the same time being our comforter. Now let me just say this. We use the word that the Holy Spirit is our comforter to mean the one who puts his arm around our shoulder and rocks us to sleep when things are bad. We get that word from John Wycliffe's translation back in around the 14th century. He translates when he talks about the Holy Spirit and he calls him the comforter. But in John Wycliffe's time, comforter, when he, called, when he says Jesus is the one who is the comforter, he means he is the one who makes us, or the Holy Spirit is our comforter. He doesn't just mean the one, he is the one who puts his arm around our shoulder and, and rocks us to sleep and makes us feel everything is all right. No, 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 no. He doesn't mean that he's the one who just lets us be a spectator in our lives while we're walking through and dealing with everything. No, he means he is the one, because this was the way that word comforter was used in the, back in the centuries of John Wycliffe. He is the one who makes us brave. The Holy Spirit, when I say he is my comforter, he makes me brave for the situations and the circumstances in which I find my life. He is the one who makes me brave. Somebody needs to get that. You need to write that down in the chat. In the early translation, when they said the word comforter, what they really meant was he makes me brave. Now remember, they, they heard a sound. They, Jesus said, you're going to be baptized. And they heard a sound that filled everything. So they are in the sound. They are in the moment of God. They see fire while they're in God's moment. And it breaks apart and rests over each and every one of them. And then they know, they know what fire does. Fire purifies. Fire preserves. Fire preserves. Fire makes us aware of what needs to be taken out of us. It purges. But fire also is the glory. It fills us. Now I'm filled with the glory, the wonder, the awe. It's taking up space that was occupied by that which I needed to let go. And the more I let it go, the more I'm occupied by this, uh, it, it, this, this amazing inexpressible understanding that I cannot articulate or put into words about the length and breadth and depth of the magnitude of the glory of God that is beyond understanding, that makes me able to be brave in every situation I once was cowardly, to handle life from a different perch because he is now not only my wonderful counselor, but he is my comforter. He comforts me with bravery. My comfort is not a tissue, but bravery. 
and I am not just having some of it, but it is filling me, not just once and for all, but filling me more and more as the fire burns up more. The fire takes over more. The fire is, I am being rid of something by the fire, but I am on fire for something because of it. You'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and what happens? What happens, and I'm closing on this, what happens after that? These men just walk right out the room, start talking. They, they, they're in a new reality. They're no longer on top of the pool looking out at something and seeing it one among many. No, they now realize they're a part of a bigger reality and all of this stuff that they were looking at before is minor compared to the reality that they're in because the reality that they're in, they can swim in. The reality they're in is governed by a whole new set of rules. The reality they are in is empowering them to handle everything that they thought was reality. And so we get the book of the Acts of the Apostles because that day they came out the room and they started to claim their next level. I'm challenging you to let the spirit move in you right now. Let hesitancy be replaced with expectation. Let stress be replaced by strength and, and the truth of what you desire from God. Stop running back and forth to Jerusalem, a little of this and a little of that. And trust God totally to be the God he's promised to always be. Well, my brothers and sisters, that brings us through this lesson on this, this very important verse, verses in the Acts of the Apostles. I hope they bless you. And I hope you see now, you're moving to your next level, but you got steps to go. You got to do some stuff to get there. Focus on him. He's popping up. He's popping up in your space regularly. And he's popping up because in a few days, he wants to fill you with the spirit, but there's some things you've got to do. You got to go back to Jerusalem. You got to wait. And you got to be disrupted because God's about to do something mighty in your space. Notice that disruption was not some war and that wasn't something bad. God shook their world and said, I need you to look in some other directions. I'm doing stuff and I'm about to come do it in you. Well, don't forget all the things that are happening at New Psalmist. I'm looking forward to seeing you Sunday. I'll be preaching as graduates today. We're saluting all of our graduates, parent, our youth parents and youth are meeting in the Connection Center. It's going to be a great day Sunday. Hampton University Ministers Conference is meeting next week. Uh, Dr. Cynthia Hale is president, well, she's president now, and she's going to preach her inaugural message on this Monday night. Second woman president in the history of the conference. It's going to be a great time. Our prayers are on the ministry cabinet there and all the great work that they're trying to do. Dr. Deborah Higgins, the executive minister, is doing so much, executive secretary, doing so much to make that conference what it can be. So listen, let's get ready to give our offerings. God's blessed us. We give through GiveLify, PushPay. We give through Fellowship One. You can send your offering by mail, 6020 Marion Drive, Baltimore, Maryland, 21215. I thank you for your gifts. We're trying to do a great work, and so I'm going to ask you, we have to redo all of our sound system, getting it ready. It's cost us well over a million dollars, and we'd love to have you help us in this effort. We'd love to have you send your gift of support to help us to do the things that God is telling us to do in a more excellent way. Well, God bless you now. I'm going to close this in prayer, and I'm believing God for all good things because we're going to our next level. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your power. Bless the work of New Psalmist Church and bless the lives that are sharing with us now. Let each person here begin to get stronger. Let them realize that what God is offering them is a gift so special and so powerful that they no longer have to keep looking for something to end, but they can start living in new beginnings with the new power, the new purpose, and the new presence to make it all worthwhile. Thank you, God. 
in Jesus' name. Bless these gifts and this weekend. And together we say amen. See you, my brothers and sisters. See you this weekend, especially see you Sunday. Take care now and tell somebody, come online with New Psalmist and be a part of our channel. Take care now. <laughs>